Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks a million for coming along this evening. Full house. Delighted to see so many new and plenty of old ones as well. Thanks a million for coming along. We've got a great evening lined up. And uh, we're going to kick off the evening with a video from one of our local video producers called Bulabuska Films. And I'll get Marika to run that now.
talked about uh, Lindsay Lickman, Steph Peters, we've got um, uh, Martha Fraser, uh, who is an online um, business, and we've also got Pat Brennan who put this on our keynote on the 16th, so I want to remind you about that and Lindsay, you did the job. We are looking for sponsorship from Steph Peters, so uh, this is for 2015, so if anybody's interested in uh, sponsoring one of the events, something around the foot in the UK Times. Um, it's really regional. You can talk to us at Windsor Regional one of the volunteers, myself or Marika or any of the volunteers out here, and uh, we, can, we can bring you through the whole thing. Uh, there's plenty of slots there for 2015. Or if you have any suggestions of people as well, any, anybody who you'd like to see talk up here, and uh, we're, we're perfectly happy to come through as well. Um, so we we'll, would we'll love to hear any kind of feedback from the evening itself or what you'd like to see from future events. Uh, if you want to get involved, we've got a few new volunteers over the last while and they all work really hard. Uh, you've probably seen and heard most of them me, obviously. And uh, Marika's always running around here as well, but we've got a lot of volunteers that do an awful lot of hard work in the background. And I just want to say a huge thanks to them because they're the ones who keep us the, the evening train in Windsor. Uh, but please do email us or talk to us, have a look at the website and get in touch. Um, we have our big Instagram sign. Where is it? Is it this side? Yeah. We have our big Instagram sign, which is great fun. So before you leave this evening, get your photograph taken with a big Instagram sign and um, you can stick it up on Twitter as well. Good publicity for us and it's good fun. And again, don't forget to use the, the hashtag uh, OBMRG uh, for the evening. Okay, so uh, we're going to kick off uh, with our first speaker. Now, I suppose Paddy Power, with one of the strongest online precedents of all the bookies, uh, Cormac has been involved with Paddy Power for about three years in the digital marketing capacity. And Cormac is going to be talking about under understanding the value of social media advertising. Cormac. Um, Good stuff. So yeah, um, Cormac Fallon, I'm the social media advertising manager with Paddy Power. I'm going to talk today about basically um, what social media does for us and how we use it. Um, we obviously have a massive presence on there and it's kind of understanding that allows us to invest more in it. So I'm going to talk through basically um, the brand and itself to social media and um, our success. So I'm going to spend a while on it. Um, this isn't self-praise because I don't actually do that stuff. So. Uh, Bear with me. Um, and then paid social, which is what I do and where that fits in. And then ultimately, the most important thing for us, the value of it and, and how we do that. And then also looking at other sides of social media like direct response advertising and CRM. So firstly, I'm going to read a quote from Paisley, who is the MD of Twitter UK. So it says, there are a small number of brands we exalt. Paddy Power sits firmly at the top of that group. They know when to be funny and importantly, when to be voice. Paddy Power are the perfect illustration of how, when you understand social media, you get more from it. So that's the MD of Twitter UK, so it's a pretty ringing endorsement from him. Also here you can see our followers have great feedback. It's clear, at Paddy Power, social media is working. At Ice Malloy, just registered for an account. The power of a funny, engaging tweet, XXX. So that also just shows um, even our followers recognize that if you, it has the potential to open accounts as well. So firstly... Paddy Power brand, so I'm sure most people in the room recognize Paddy Power and understand the type of brand it is. We're really lucky that um, this goes the whole way through the business. So you can see here our annual reports, which generally are probably pretty boring for most businesses, had a horse meat recipe in 2012, a little book that went out to our stakeholders. And then uh, last year was a vinyl celebrating 25 years, so now 25 with song lyrics and stuff like that. So this is going out to our stakeholders, which is, uh, it just shows that the brand and the whole identity goes the whole way through the business. So. What do we do? Um, it's worth bearing in mind and pointing out at this stage. Our demographic is males 18 plus in the UK. So you can see, I'm going to throw a few uh, examples here, and you can see the sort of content device put out and what sort of resonates with our, with our audience. So it's gold mostly, and Man United have been great this year because uh, as a Man United fan, they haven't been great, but for social media, they've been great. Um, and so David Moyes was great. 
personal favorite here. Um, you can see here, this one got 6,000 retweets in half an hour during the World Cup when they brought the white spray on the pitch. Um, and then we had our own bladder splatter, which was, uh, we got the tins of it and we were able to give it out then to people, to our followers. Then John Terry is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, <laughs> everyone loves to hate him. This got a huge engagement again. Uh, it's just taking those everyday moments, those things are happening in the news, the kind of cliche of joining the conversation, but putting a twist on it that we know that our followers are going to get and are going to uh, resonate with. And then if you look at um, last week, uh, Kim Kardashian tried to break the internet, and uh, Colo Torre was put in uh, one of her prized assets. So I'll move on from that. So what, what does it mean? Um, basically, if we compare ourselves to our competitors, uh, we are streets ahead, we're miles ahead, and uh, we actually kind of, at this stage, look at brands like Adidas and, and Nike and those sort of brands. We know that our demographic would, would have been leaned towards, and that's where we measure ourselves. But obviously, uh, our business owners like this slide. And just saying, you can see here, the number of engagements is just, you know, 10, 20, whatever, whatever we're not getting. And also, it's not just that we have more fans and followers, but that we engage with them as a percentage of fans more so as well. So we have much better content than everyone else, and I'll show you what that means. Likewise, Twitter, um, as far as I'm concerned, guys, we have own Twitter, um, especially across gambling, it's huge for us. And you can see here the weekend thing, we have more engagement than all our competitors put together in shape of two. So it's pretty, pretty special. So where does paid social fit in all this? So what do we do? We, as I said earlier, we know our demographic are 18 plus males in the UK, basically, and Ireland, but, you know, um, Ireland is obviously not as scalable. So we invest in our, in our audience. So we, we build and we promote and we buy fans. And when I say buy fans and use terminology like that, I'm not talking about getting 5,000 you know, bots from Bangladesh and having them as a branding member. These are really quality people that we're putting like that in front of and we're saying, like our brand. We know that you like Man United, you like Paddy Polly, get the best odds for a bit of banter. Um, and, and likewise. And you can see here, it's a really interesting graph that with the green line, and we just kept going up and up and up and up. Um, there's two really um, kind of standout uh, points here for me, and this is here and here. So you can see this is Will Hill, this is Skybet. They're both at different stages, kind of tried to go toe to toe with Paddy Power and Will Hill especially. This is not cheap. Um, there is obviously a certain amount of organic investment or organic uh, growth, but to invest like that to grow at that rate, especially at a time when social media is just kicking off in, in this side. Um, we invested very, very heavily, very early. At one point, someone asked a question about here in Will Hill and said, what's the ROI? Why are we getting to this? And there was kind of a, almost a revolt in social media saying, you know, fans and followers, what do they actually mean? Who knows? So they probably couldn't answer the question, or if they could, uh, it wasn't what their business owners wanted to hear. We could answer the question, which I'll come to in a minute, and that's where we continue to grow and grow. Likewise, on Twitter, um, same again, green line, high power, up, 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 and up. And Skybet went a bit mad last year. Uh, I think it was two weeks before their Premiership kicked off in uh, 2013, and they doubled their their their, their fan base. And that's as I said, it's not cheap. And anyone who thinks you can grow that way uh, organically, it doesn't really happen that way for for brands like us, because people generally on social media gambling would be an issue where people would want to you know tell their family and friends all the time. We have like a million people on, on Facebook admitting that they like Paddy Power, they like the gambling product, it's huge. And likewise, nearly half a million on Twitter. So about here, same again, someone asked the question, you know, what does this mean to us? What's the value here? What are we getting from it? Um, and also just kind of a little side note on this one. Anyone remembers uh, Stephen Jett from Heading in the Year? Uh, hashtag TP Text. It just shows that there is a, a huge amount of organic growth here as well. That was 15,000 uh, followers in about two days. Okay, so what would a typical journey look like to become a customer? So our KPI is based around value and about new customers. So ultimately, I have to get customers for Paddy Power using social media. What would a typical week look like for on a, on a Premiership weekend or Premier League weekend? Basically, it would look like this during the week. You won't see anything about new customers about signing up. It's about engaging, engaging, engaging. It's about Roy Keane last week seeing, seeing what Roy Keane does. It's about David Moyes joining right up to Sociedad. Likewise, continue on. Content, content, content. Then it comes to a point when we know people are about to want to become join us, start gambling with us, or want to engage with our product or buy our product. And that's really important to point out, because that's the time when we're, we're selling our t-shirts. 
So at the time when we know the man is there, the intent is there, and about three hours before kickoff, a match and someone wants to have a punt, that's when we put the sound message in there. So there's a, the tagline there that my old man gave us was clear is engage a lot and sell a little. So it's engage, engage, engage. At the point when you want to sell to them, you get the sell message from them and you make sure you have the right offer in the right place at the right time. And likewise, Sunday kicked off, it's going to be the Manchester Derby and having the having that offer, <coughs> real offer in front of them at the right time. That's a really important to point out is that sell sell posts on Facebook and on uh, on Twitter don't generally get much engagement. People don't want to see them. When someone's not looking to buy something, they don't want to keep hearing about the product being, you know, down or canal or comfort store or whatever it might be, eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning. But they might want to see a funny thing about Jorginho for last night or David Moyes. And then when it comes to that point when they're ready to buy, that's when you hit them and when you when you when you invest in with the pay side of things as well. So what does it actually do? So it's very easy for me to sit up here and say, you know, we've got great engagement, great engagement, without actually answering any questions about the numbers behind it. So this is what um, ultimately why it's kind of account for as well. I'm going to look at our fans and our followers in two ways, and it's kind of important for us to point out these two sides of it. The first side of it is basically people who have become a social follower before they become a customer. So this is basically um, them being a social follower, them following us on Twitter, being a fan on Facebook, has influenced their journey to becoming a customer. And it's really important to distinguish between that. Secondly, we look at our actual face, who are our social followers, who are engaging with us day on day. The line I have here is, are they valuable because they are fans, or are they fans because they're valuable? And that's always the counter argument to social media, is that social media is everywhere, everyone's on Facebook. So if you're telling me that because they're on Facebook they're more valuable, how do you know it's not the fact that they were more valuable in the first place, and then they went on Facebook anyways, as they would have done, and because they've already bought into the brand? So we can try and answer that question because hopefully we'll show you how we do it. So firstly, this is a graph that shows the retention of customers. We have the blue line being both, people who are on both social networks that we advertise on, Twitter being orange, Facebook being gray, and then non-fans along here as yellow. So this is a pretty, um, it shows exactly the sort of level of, of, of incremental value we get from these guys. So this in here is basically <coughs> when people join up, after this period of time, you can see that people are twice as likely to be betting with us the following week than they would have been had they not been a social follower. This is really powerful to turn around and say, because for anyone who's in a business like us, and I'm sure many of you are in a similar sort of business where you want returning customers, it's not a one-off sale. You want people to be constantly coming back to product, betting every weekend or betting, you know, Champions League match of the week. It's really important that these people come back. If you have some way of keeping them on your site, like social media, that's a really, unobtrusive way of getting to them, an unobtrusive way of CRM getting them back. This is how what it, what it can do. So you can see by you know this period at the end, there's nearly 10 times as many of our social followers that are still active. And what does that do for us? Basically, the bottom line is value. So it drives you more value for us. You can see after this period again, that gap there between the gray bar being non-fans and the yellow bar being, say, our Twitter followers in this example, that's what the incremental value is. That's what they're worth to us. What this allows us to do is to turn around and reinvest that money back into our into our social media and say, okay, our business owners ask us what's it driving. We can say this bit here is, is X amount. We know we can pay that much for a follower and that's going to convert. And that means we're going to be re returning you know more money back over that period of time. So if we invest that X amount there to get these people as followers and converting, from this point on, you know, they're it's going to keep growing and that's going to be worth so much to pay for. So secondly then, moving on, looking at our active customers, again, using um, percentage active in the previous month as kind of a proxy for, uh, for retention, you can see that they're about 1.3, 1.4 times more likely to still be active with us the previous month than people who aren't fans. These people are just sticking around. So one of our main metrics, obviously, is one of the best people place. What we know what this drives is basically these guys just drive bet a lot more. They're not coming in and betting huge amounts, but just way more active than our average customers are. And you can see here, again, the turnover, it's just driving more and more there. So we can see that Twitter followers are turning over twice as much per customer than our non-fans. And likewise, Facebook is, has got value there as well, and people who are on both, um, both platforms are still about one point, you know, one and a half times more valuable there as well. So basically, that kind of outlines the first part of our strategy around acquiring uh, fans and followers, building our customer base, engaging them, um, and then you know, turning them into active and, and long-term valuable customers. The second part then of social media I want to talk about today is 
direct response. So social media, anyone here who works in, in social media and is kind of advertised on Facebook before and Twitter will understand that it's very hard to define where social media fits in the whole overall kind of digital marketing um, network. So basically, you have things like PPC and affiliate and, and the SEO, which would kind of traditionally operate as, as a last click channel. So basically, it's the last thing that happens before someone signs up. So basically, they're, they're intent-driven customers. They're coming in, typing in your, your product into Google and then becoming a customer that way. Social media is different. We have to go to customers, we have to broadcast, and we have to be in the right place at the right time. We don't have the luxury of people coming to us. So Facebook have really tried to shift their strategy and Twitter um, over the last year or so especially to be more of a direct response channel, be able to um, create ad units and targeting that's going to convert people on a last click basis. And we have um, jumped at this. So basically a direct response, what I mean is it's an advert-led strategy. So um, it's basically all sale, it's all sell posts, it's um, fully sponsored, there's no organic site behind this. Um, likewise, um, what we do and what we can leverage on Facebook and on social media is the fact that we have these targeting options um, that are unique to, to Facebook and Twitter. So firstly, anyone who's advertised on Facebook will know one of its strengths is that I could pick um, a male aged 31 in Manchester who uh, likes Manchester United and has used a credit card in the last three months, which is crazy, it's powerful, you know, and being able to go to those people and say, here, I know what you like, this is an offer that's just like what you like, join us, become a customer, and then I know how to hit you back and keep you, keep you active, active. So it's really powerful. Custom audiences, um, so these can kind of scare people sometimes. So basically, you know that ad you saw that was a pair of shoes you saw the last day that you were looking at? This is why they happen, because people can retarget you and can know who you are based on your email address by matching it, and also by placing um, what's called pixels on your website and matching them up. So Facebook can build audiences of people that you have designed, that you have uploaded for them. So uh, there's no coincidence when you get really hit with things. It doesn't really happen in digital marketing anymore. Um, Look-alike audiences. Again, this is where Facebook or Twitter can build an audience of people that look like an audience you've uploaded. So say I take soccer punters and upload an audience of them. Um, Facebook will then say, okay, well these have all these common traits between them, and I'm gonna build an audience of people that look just like them that aren't your customers, and you can target them. It'll be quite powerful. And then Twitter has keyword and search targeting where you can target, like, like paid search, you can target, and if someone looks up Wayne Rooney, you can have a Wayne Rooney ad going to them. So the ad units we use for direct response look like these link post ads and app install ads. Um, the link post ads, as you can see here, this is a mobile screen. Um, they take up an awful lot of the real estate on the screen, full, um, and you get a really good graphic picture there, and with a lot of text, so you can get your message across quite well. App install ads are the single best way of getting your app on someone's phone. Um, it links straight to the app store. You can download straight away, and you can, the level of targeting you have to do that is really, really powerful. So these are ideas that we've invested a lot of money in as well, just getting our app and having a multi-platform <coughs> customer, you know it's going to be more valuable that way. So lastly, <coughs> CRM. I touched on it a minute ago, but um, this is another really powerful area of social media, I just don't think people understand or haven't utilized fully yet. Um, as I said, you can build a custom audience from a pixel that goes in your site. So you might have a, an e-commerce site that's selling shoes, you can have this pixel that's gonna build an audience of anyone who visits that page, so you know re-hit these guys with shoes because that's what they like. And they've already shown intent to be there in the last two days or whatever time period. Um, also with email addresses, again, as I said, you can upload email addresses and match these guys and entirely target those people with Facebook ads. Um, it's kind of, kind of scary for some people, but you don't want to be too creepy about it. So, um, this is an ad we ran earlier in the year, and we had a promotion on a horse called Annie Power. The horse lost. Basically, um, we brought loads of customers through, and we wanted to get them to come back because they lost the, the, the race and they didn't have any money in their account, so we figured, let's give you guys a bonus, make sure they come back. This, so, we uploaded, we turned this ad around in about 20 minutes. We uploaded a um, list of the audience of the people that came through. And you can see that we reached 82% of the audience. Click rate was 28%, which for anyone who's on social media knows that that's pretty staggering. And it costs seven euros to get these hundreds of people back to our site. But it just shows you don't have to be investing you know, millions and millions and millions of, of euros. There are certain tools and um, you know, uh, advertising units that are actually quite cheap to run and have a huge effect. So <coughs> hopefully what I've outlined for today is where social media sits with high power. For me, it actually sits across the whole marketing funnel. Um, brand awareness, brand consideration, 
like I mentioned, direct response. Uh, you can purchase from their Twitter, even have a buying algorithm <coughs> coming. Um, brand loyalty with your fans and your followers, and then advocacy. It's a broadcasting network, so hopefully they say nice things about you. So that's it from me. very honest and relevant stories that, that can hopefully help you guys along along the along the journey. So I actually um, went to school and I was really, really bad in school. So I got uh, I failed the same year three times. I think I was about to fail it the, the fourth time, but they just they were like, look, get out of here. So I, I actually got kicked out of school um, and I had no idea what I was gonna do um, at all. Uh, really, really um, lost. I was like 16, 17. And uh, my dad just said, look, why don't you go and uh, you need some sort of trade behind you. Why don't you go and be a chef or, or something like that? And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. I must have like, been hanging around the cooker or something. Like, there must have been some, some reason for it. But I, I left school um, at 17, and I went to cooking school. That's not me. That's the guy I worked for. <laughs> I haven't lost loads of weight. <laughs> OK, I just did a piece. Um, um, no, so I went to. Um, cooking college and I was, I was okay at cooking college but um, again it was very uh, formulaic and you had to be sort of uh, there at certain times and you had you know four or five hours to make a bowl of soup uh, which anybody who's worked in, in the kitchen or a restaurant or even a bar knows that that's, that has no practical relation to, uh, to real life. So I went down to this guy's kitchen, he's a guy called uh, Conrad Gallagher, infamous, you might have heard of him, a bit dodgy. Um, <laughs> But at the time, he had a Michelin star in Dublin, and I just walked in the back door, and I was like, look, and I have a job. I was 18. I was new to Dublin. Um, and all I knew was that, that he was the best. So, so they gave me a job. I didn't get paid anything. I was just literally, it's a, it's a cliche, but I was peeling potatoes and picking spinach and, and all the crappy jobs that you basically do. But it was fascinating, because there was a world of like 32 uh, chefs in the kitchen. I think nearly all of them was, were men. There was one, one woman at the time. Um, but they were walking around with big sharp knives and huge hot pots of boiling water. And I was just immersed into the meat today. I absolutely loved it. Um, and I learned more in, in, in there in, in maybe a week than I did in, in two years of college. But um, So I went on and did that, uh, really embraced chef and loved it. Um, but for anybody who's worked in the kitchen, you'll know that it's not like Jamie Oliver or any of the cooking shows where they're like sprinkling herbs on top of stuff and, and all that. Like it's, it's really hard work. You're on your feet all day for 16 hours. It's hot. Uh, you're people screaming at you. It's a very stressful environment. So I did that for four years, but then I decided I needed a, a new job, right? So I was like, where can I go and work? That is, I was obviously had some skills as a chef. I was a head chef at that stage. So I actually got a, a job uh, on this boat. Um, now, just to tell you the story of the boat, it's owned by a guy called um, Paul Allen, who basically set up Microsoft with Bill Gates. Um, and when they set it up, he had 40%, Bill Gates had 60%. But after a couple of years, he actually got sick uh, and he left the company, but he still had his 40%, which was really nice because he didn't have to do any work. Um, and he basically became like a professional playboy um, and traveled all over the world. So this is actually one of his boats. 
It's uh, 500 feet long. Doesn't look that big, but like that, that's the length of uh, a football pitch, basically. Like you can put it to scale by the helicopter there. There's actually two helicopters, one on each end. Uh, that was the staff helicopter where we used to take it and we'd go and do the shopping if we are in a really remote place. It's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy world. There's 60 crew on that boat. My job for most of the year was to cook for the crew. Um, he would come on the boat, even though it cost about, I think, 400 million to buy it. Uh, he would come on the boat for about eight or nine days a year. Um, he'd have three of them, so there'd be one in Antarctica, one in south of France, one in Australia. So he could fly directly to, to fill it up with petrol, would cost a million just to, just to take it across the Atlantic. So it's a crazy, crazy world. Um, but for the most part, we, we lived on there as if we were billionaires and traveled all over the world. I used to play basketball down on the back there as we're crossing the Atlantic. So it was a cool, cool life, and I did that for two years. Um, but I was on there, and, and it's, it's really cool for a number of reasons, because you get to travel the whole world, but also because you can't physically spend any money because you're in... Um, you're getting paid pretty well, you, can't, you don't have to pay for food, rent, anything like that. It's beer, everything's free. Um, so I saved up a bit of money, um, and I was kind of looking around, and, and my brain works in weird ways, but I was like, okay, uh, this big boat is pretty cool. Like, the, like I wouldn't mind one of these. Um, and I can cook, and this is 2006, and I just made a little uh, video. video. This, this is like, like the year, year after YouTube, YouTube launched. launched. I had loads, loads of spare time on my hand, because um, he wasn't there. there. And I just made a video of how to cook a steak, and I uploaded it to YouTube. Um, and it's, I went to bed, no, I didn't even really know what YouTube was, I actually had no idea, and I just uploaded it. And I woke up the next morning and it was on this homepage of a web which isn't really around anymore. Um, but the video blew up, it got 150,000 views. Um, and I shot it on my crappy camera, uh, before, this, before we had smartphones or anything. So all these things started going around my brain, I was like, okay, wow, we're on to something here. Uh, let's start a business. So I had the cash, uh, called my called uh, friends and family and I was like, look, I'm quitting the job, I'm going to start a business, it's going to be brilliant, we're going to be the next Facebook and everything all rolled into one, full of optimism like we all are when we start a business. Um, so I quit the boat, came back to Ireland, um, I convinced my best friend to quit his job, he was uh, working for Davy Stock. Uh, his parents, I don't think, have really forgiven me yet, um, but he had a really good career and everything. Uh, and, and off we went and did this. So we started off with 150 grand, most money, friends and family, basically uh, savings of all our own. We built the website and we got lots of traction, um, and so much traction that we were able to, to give us 450 grand, which is a lot of money for two kids who are like 25 and 26. Um, and we, we, we thought we were doing brilliant. We were getting loads of newspaper coverage. We were, um, got it up to a million visitors a month, which is pretty healthy internet traffic. Um, what we did in the first, first week was we were like, okay, let's charge people for this. It's really premium content, it's chefs, it's really professional. And I think we charged them 40 euros uh, a year. So a yearly subscription, 40 euros. And amazingly, 20 people signed up for it. So uh, it, was, it was awesome. Like, no, actually 100 people. We had 4,000 uh, euros uh, revenue in our first month, right? Which for a startup is pretty damn good uh, back in those days. So in our infinite wisdom, we were like, that's not enough money. Like we're never gonna get the boat from that. So we scrapped the, the business model straight away and we decided to go with advertising so everybody could see our videos. And I think that was the last money we ever made. Um, everything from then on was a disaster. It was a, the biggest failure of a business that you could, you could ever have. We were changing business model every week. We were, uh, fighting with each other, we were just like, it just, and what, it went on for about 18 months, and then the business uh, folded, which for any of you guys, and I'm sure uh, at least a third of the room or more probably have had a business of some sort who's, who, that has failed, it's uh, one of the hardest, most painful, uh, really, really kind of embarrassing nearly, you'd say at the time, uh, things to have happened to you, and multiply that by 100 when you've lost your dad's money, friends money like it's horrendous um, as, as you'll you'll attest to if it's happened to you so I was in a pretty bad position at that stage I was kind of down and, and and literally to the point where you wouldn't go to the pub with your your mates because you'd be like Jesus they've been bigging me up for years we're gonna be the next big YouTube and all that and then suddenly it's like oh shit we're we're toast 
Um, so that was a huge learning curve and a massive failure. No, no problem admitting that. Um, and so I had a choice then. I could either go back to the boats uh, or start another business. So somehow we started another business. Uh, we had 10 grand this time. And I had two important lessons. The first one was like, you don't necessarily need to go and raise loads of money uh, because we'd blown all the 500 grand we had, uh, not, not using it very well. And the second one, uh, I forgot the second one. Uh, but but um, so we started the business and it was myself and Lauren and uh, we started in my spare bedroom and luckily with this one it like didn't work any harder because we worked like our, our uh, sales into the ground on both businesses but I think our timing was just a lot better so this was 2009 uh, it was a social media agency so we helped big brands uh, understand social media so the likes of Paddy Power would have uh, been ahead of the curve but for every Paddy Power there's another 500 Vodafones and companies who weren't at the races, uh, pardon upon, in those days. Uh, so we went along and helped them with strategy and, and stuff, and we built it into a company of um, 50 people, uh, offices in Dublin and London and uh, Belfast, and it was really, really cool. And that one got acquired, so that was like, well, hey, done something right. Um, but there wasn't that big, oh yeah, that's the second lesson I learned. The first day I went into Simply Desti, I was like, okay, we gotta make money from day one, which, which we never did with iFoods, which sounds like a very obvious thing, but startups kind of forget that quite a lot, that uh, you're actually in business to make money. Uh, even though Paddy Power have got all the nice fluffy John Terry stuff and David Moyes, there's a very uh, focused bottom line at the end of that, and that's why they're so successful. So um, that was the second one. Um, but I wanted to, so like, this is kind of just going through the, the whole story, but uh, one important lesson that I like, I, I talk about this in the book, um, so that's a really, I guess people would look at from the outside and see it as a successful company. You've got 50 people working for me, you've sold it, uh, all those sort of things. But like during that time, I actually suffered from depression, like proper depression, uh, where I couldn't get out of bed. Uh, I'd be like literally sitting on the floor, um, one day in perfect perfect form and then in the next day it would just hit you like a brick wall now it's a subject in Ireland that people don't really talk about or want to talk about at all but it affects one in four people and it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, uh, prevalent so like that's one of the things I said out I was like why just talk about all the the good stuff uh, because you're all in businesses you've all got the same challenges and, that, and that's the one that I faced and the, the other one was the way that I, I dealt with it was drink and that's me there looking pretty hammered um, and, and, and I wanted to bring up those two stories because it's everybody has those pressures and like I wasn't very good at dealing with with uh, people coming to me with like when you're a boss for the first time you realize people come to you with like marriage problems and uh, the baby's sick and like all these things that like a 30 year old guy's like Jesus how do I deal with this so I would go off and get hammered because I'd be like <laughs> sitting in the pub going like really, really tough when you, you know, I, I think I'm a bit better at it now, but it's really, really tough. But like, I took it out, uh, all joking aside, uh, and those were my two biggest problems were drinking and, and depression. And like, uh, you have to deal with those kind of things if you want to overcome with them and, and, and like kind of hit them head on. Everybody's got very real problems and it's, and it's important to address them. So anyway, moving on. Could have been, um, probably should have just gone and stayed on the beach for a while uh, after selling the business and chilled out. But I think all of you will know as entrepreneurs, it's, it's actually nothing to do with the money, it's to do with the buzz. So like if you guys are building uh, whatever it is, be it a, a website or uh, anything at all, it's, it's about the buzz. So I like two weeks sitting on the beach, I did sit on the beach. Uh, I was like, okay, I need another challenge. So the challenge I went for was writing a book. And the reason I did that was mainly uh, to go back to my teachers and be like, haha, I'm not that fucking stupid after all. Uh, you fuckers and give them a book, but um, <laughs> no, like I, I actually did it for myself as well. So, it was, but but that was one of the main reasons was taking a challenge um, that 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 I couldn't do. Um, since then, I've gone on and and I just wanted to kind of uh, talk um, about like passion products pr projects. So, Love in Dublin is a website I've got. If you're ever in Dublin, check it out. There's restaurants and swearing and stuff like that on it. But it started out as uh, when we sold Simply Zesty, I was kind of sitting around. Um, and I had to do what's called an earn out, so you have to stay for a little while. And I was like, okay, I'll start a little passion project. So I, I just did a blog and I started writing restaurant reviews. No intention of it starting into a business. 
and I'm sure you guys do that all the time, like you're probably in your businesses, but you might have little side projects. One of the best examples in the world is Twitter. Twitter started off as a little side project in another bigger business, so I'd, I'd really embrace the idea of side project. Um, I started that and, and just started reviewing uh, restaurants for fun because I wanted to go out and eat out more, and, and it just started growing and it turned into a business by completely because I had loads of money to put into it. We built it on a WordPress site for 700 quid and I take all the photos on my, on my iPhone. So um, that grew and it's now like 500,000 uh, Dubliners visited every month. There's six staff working on it. So it was an accident of a business. But I, I think it's very important. The reason I think that's been successful is because it's, I'm, I'm passionate about it and I, I love doing it. It never feels like a, a second of work. Um, and that's one other message that I wanted to kind of give you is like if you ever you're doing something um, and it feels like it's it's hard work, or you're counting the clock, the, the minutes down on the clock. That's a really really dangerous time in life. Like I got like that on the boat. I got like that when I was in the kitchens, um, and I got like that at the end in Simply Zesty. Like if you're counting the seconds down and, uh, to the end of your day to five to five and watching the last few seconds, like get out of there, especially if it's your own business. Um, because like life's way, way too short. You have to be doing something that you absolutely love. So um, that's, that's an example of something I love and we've grown it into Berlin, different cities, and hopefully we'll turn it into something really big like Lonely Planet or something like that. So that, that's kind of the plan with that one. Um, and then the other one I'm doing at the moment is Pickstash, which is if you're looking at uh, Paddy Power, Slides Air Cormacs, um, and everything on the web, we have all driven by images, right? We're all getting an awful lot stupider at the moment because like we just go under our phones and like this is all we do all day long. Like nobody reads anything anymore. You just read a headline and an image. So I'm kind of betting everything on the next company and that people will need a lot of images that they own and that they can um, If you look at sites like BuzzFeed, uh, to Twitter, to Facebook, to every, like it's all image driven. So uh, we think there's a big niche amazing images of Ireland. If you want any images, go on to Pickstash. Um, I'm going to kind of finish up with two stories um, that are, like, I think that have really helped me along the way. Um, when I was working on the, my after that really big one, the guy that Paul Allen, I went on another one um, for six months, and he, there was a guy on there, and he was like 85, and he was like, super rich, he was like worth, well like only 3 billion compared to 30, but he was, he was relatively rich, he built bridges all over the world, and he was kind of dying um, when I was, no he was, he was like, like maybe Parkinson's, like he was in his, it was really like debilitative disease, he had a nurse and everything, so he was dying, and they used to wheel him out every day onto the back here and I'd cook him lunch, and he never really spoke to me at all, because um, he, 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 I thought he couldn't, he just like mumbled to his wife and stuff. And then like on, the day I was leaving, he, was, he like he called me up and he was like, look, um, he wants to have a word with you. And I was like, oh, like he can't talk, what's he gonna say to me? Um, so I'm standing there and uh, he's like, look, um, all of this, like we're looking out at a beautiful Caribbean island and he's like, look, all of this is amazing and it's really nice to get here. But he was like, I, I know I'm gonna die. If I could just have two weeks younger to enjoy the journey a little bit more it would be way way more important so like the message that he was kind of saying was like look we're all racing every single day like we're fucking trying to get emails out and tweets and videos and like how many impressions you're doing and all that sort of stuff like sometimes you achieve really nice goals and it's it's important to kind of to celebrate them as you go along and I was like nodding there I was going yeah like that's easy for you to say on a fucking two billion euro yacht but no, enjoy the journey was the, the message that he was saying because we do rush rush through stuff uh, an awful lot. And the, the kind of thing, like I have so many businesses going on at the moment and so many things that I'm kind of doing, but like what's kind of grounded me, those are my two dogs. Uh, and the way I look at it now is like no matter how bad things get uh, throughout the day or no matter how shitty your financial position seems in the company or how much your boss is giving out to you or your co-founder's a pain in the arse or whatever it is, like I can go back and I know that they're always going to be the same. So that's, that's, that's the thing that kind of has kept me grounded in the past couple of years. Um, but it's always, it's always uh, uh, a struggle for, for everybody in their businesses. I realized that. And I just kind of wanted to sort of finish up by sort of saying, I think uh, this is amazing. Like I, I get loads of offers to do talks and stuff and I kind of stop doing them because they take a lot of time. But I'll always do them for students uh, in Ireland because I think nobody really goes and talks to students uh, enough and gives them guidance and tells them that being an entrepreneur is not a crazy thing to be doing. It's a good thing to be doing. And the other one is like 
business organisations like yourself who've got up your arse and, and actually gone and done something like this and got yourselves all in a room because especially it's great in Dublin at the moment like you can feel the the you wouldn't even know there's a recession on anymore like the restaurants all packed the place is booming again and, and that's brilliant but like going down the country you see it it's a bit uh, it was desolate going down to, to rural places but I've noticed in the last six months or so going to places like Galway and I was in uh, Tipperary like there's a real energy back and that's I just wanted to say genuinely that's because of people like yourselves getting off your arses and coming out to things like this on a Tuesday night so pat yourselves on the back well done cheers guys Thanks a million for that, uh, Niall. Brilliant uh, talk. Uh, I, I don't know where, where, quite where to start with that. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, throw the, the floor open to any, I'd say we have quite a few, but uh, who wants to kick off with the first question? Nobody ever. Yeah, it, it's a good observation. Like um, for me, Twitter is uh, firstly there's no edge rank with Twitter, um, so it's a lot more kind of uh, in your face. And Paddy Power are very active on Twitter, and um, so I feel it, it's that there's just more content for these people and are more engaged. And the guys love Twitter, and we we, we kind of almost own it. So um, for us, in a way, kind of one of these things you hear is that like a share of voice is something equal to a share of wallet. And we're we're in an industry where people have multiple accounts, so. If we can get that share of wallet at the right time, that's what drives it. I think just Twitter probably just does that a little bit better because of the constant feed of, of content around really important times, whereas Facebook might kind of, say, punish you and not have as much uh, reach uh, to all your followers. Any other questions? text yeah uh, no to answer your question I, I didn't do any courses or anything like that I'm, I'm not very creative myself I can leave that to other people I have an opinion but it's usually not very good um, so uh, yeah Facebook like see, Facebook kind of can do what they want really you know and uh, this 20% 20% rule is an absolute nightmare for us as well as you can imagine we've designed teams we have to brief it in and for anyone who hasn't uh, been involved with it, it it's kind of bullshit as well in that it's not done on what you actually think that's taking 20% of the screen. It's that there's a, a grid system where it has to take up less than four of 20 boxes. So it's really frustrating for us as well. So, you know, our account manager was in today and we were, you know, giving out to him about power editor, we're giving out to him about yes, this rule, you're not going to be refused at times. And it is very frustrating. And, and that's, that's kind of going back to the Twitter, Twitter thing. It, it's actually quite um, refreshing with Twitter. They're really open to trying new things. And like, they are, you know, we have a very good relationship with both because they spend a lot of money. But they're actually very open to, um, you know, trying new things out and being a lot more kind of, um, find yourself. It, it's, it's just a kind of better platform sometimes kind of trying to prove itself, but it's a little more kind of like that, more rule-based like Google in a way. And just for, for Carmen, just you were saying there about the, the creative side, you know when the, there was the potty, our uh, Twitter account, it was the text message from the Saturday night into Sunday, that was, and it was very completed. The, the conversation, yeah, and to see like you're always uh, creating, and you don't feel like you have any boundaries yeah. within any of the advertisements, or like I know it wasn't advertising, <coughs> but it certainly gives a good traction on the uh, on Twitter. Um, and then with your dealings with, I think it was with is it John Perry as well. Was there a lawsuit there? To kind of. Uh, no, I don't think it was John Perry. We've had a few in the past. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Surprising, some people don't like being pulled the piss out of as much as you think. Uh, Joe Hart didn't like some of the dandruff stuff we were doing. And we, we sometimes have partnerships with different teams, so the teams, like, it could sometimes be a nightmare for a partnership with, say, Man City, they turn around saying, stop pulling the piss out of Joe Hart, but like, you're head and shoulders ads here, and like, you're asking for it here, like, so, uh, but yeah, the PP text one's a good example of kind of how, uh, as a brand, we can, they've given license to social media to do what it wants, in a way, and they trust them that they have this tone of voice that they know what's the right tone. And, and sometimes they might take it too far, but you have to kind of take, take a risk like that. And it goes all the way through the brand, as I said earlier, the stunts, the guys, like, I saw a really good quote um, 
from one of the guys, our, our head of mischief at the moment, which is an actual title of a role in Paddy Powers, <laughs> and who's a crazy man, but uh, he, he, he had a quote recently and he was saying, uh, you know, the only, the only songs you haven't heard of are the ones that uh, never got past, never got there. So, like, it's, it's, in a way, it, it's all about kind of trying to push the boundaries and seeing, and, and the brand that has to brand that says the social guys, do what you want, you know, that we trust you with this. sit separate to us and then they also sit separate to the, the social content team. So we, they, all they're very aligned and we all have a, a really strong relationship. It's not actually a point of like we're all sitting on the table and we say that's really funny, that's not. There's some agencies involved and um, as I said earlier my pitch back in the day for as well. Um, there are some agencies involved along the way um, and as the, the head of the institute was kind of working on some of the, the bigger stuff and then it's just having that tone of voice that carries through from the brand all the way through to the social guys and, and knowing and having clearly defined, and this is one of the points if, if Michal, who manages that team, was here, he'd say, having a really clear, defined tone of voice and, and, and what they want to have on social, and they have a literally outline like I am, you know, as a person, as who they are, you know, they, they understand which person or a group of friends they are and where they sit. So it's kind of just, it's actually a team of four guys who do the content, which is perfect. And I can never tell who's who, you don't know the guys personally. And this just shows how clear they are with their tone, that they know this is exactly what's going to work, and this is what our fans want to hear, and we'll keep, we'll keep doing that. Like everything, I think. Um, if you like, w once you fail for the first time, and then you like, you have this perception that it's going to be the worst thing in the world, and that uh, it's really scary, and it is at the time. But once you get through it, you realise that your your real mates are still your real mates, and that uh, you know your family still care about you, and all those sort of things. It it, it gives you. Like if you're in college and you've got four years of course that you're, you're taking, 
like jump out of it in year one. Like it's not like the world's not going to fall apart just because you, you jumped out of college. Like everybody from Mark Zuckerberg to Oprah to all these sort of people have, have jumped out of college. So it's more about just not being like don't stick on the path that other people have planned out for you. Like maybe your parents want you to be a lawyer and you know like. I know somebody like that, and they hate their job, and they're 30, and they're like they're trying to they're trying to figure it out for six years. But just to be a little bit uh, more open to risks. Thank you. Yes. And you were starting with Like we we had many arguments over this. Me and Sean, who we fell out for a year after Brooke and I were friends again, and uh, I. I think so, yeah, we, we probably could, but um, we made every mistake in the book. Uh, like I said, I don't think we worked any harder in the second one than the first one. Uh, like, the timing was good. Uh, yeah, I think we... Um, I, I think we could... It's probably the, the horrible word, super trendy at the moment, we would, we would have pivoted it into something else, like, so we would have changed it into, like, maybe a... a food content agency that made really high-end videos or so like it, it, we wouldn't have tried to be Facebook for foodies which is what we're trying to do so hopefully um, we could have but experience is really really important like in the second business and in Love and Dublin now uh, like I've hired managers and GMs who can do spreadsheets and all the boring stuff that I can't so like we should have probably done that when we were younger we thought we could just like do everything ourselves we Yeah, like two years. Yeah. <coughs> you're able to bring your numbers up quite fast with Facebook and your awareness. Do you think that's because of your previous success, or did you find anything like Paddy Powers in buying, or what? Ireland is a lot smaller, so what would you recommend for companies that are trying to get a bit of exposure? Uh, like, like, I think it's it's really good that Paddy Power here in as well. Like, we've got a tone on love in Dublin that's like I, I speak it, like I write it like I talk, and so do the others. And I think like the business culture was very much about taking your little piece of paper and getting it approved by your manager and then uh, like you know like there's certain cultures in place it's taken you know the big telco companies the banks six years like they knew social was here at the same time they haven't been able to adapt so i think you can take a lot more risks with your content like you don't always need to be perfect uh with with your copy and your uh you know um have a perfectly stylized picture or, or whatever it's like just take take a few more risks and um and and really the other the other thing is like knowing your audience so like I'm sure Paddy Power don't have like you know there's a team of four I'm sure they don't have like a six month course that they go and train how you get the tone of voice and stuff like that. Like same with Love and Double people come in and it's all through your culture of your company. Like we uh you know like we're, we're like if you walk into Paddy's Power, uh, with Party Power building, which I have, you'll you'll see that like it's not surprising that that's the content that comes out of the tweet at the very other end of it. Like it's it's all about how your culture and, and sharing your own culture. It's a bit of a shitty answer, but last one. But you you interact directly with you don't buy your, your followers or. We're lucky we don't don't have to because yeah. we're not a. So just a, interacting with them. And yeah, at the start, loads of interaction. So like yeah. the first say two, three thousand followers in Love and Dublin would have been me like answering people's recipe requests or or people would have been like, geez, would you try this with a tomato soup? And I'd be like, oh look here, I made you a tomato soup and then they'd start taking pictures. So like the first two, three thousand is like hard work. Like and, and I have been there like in all the companies I've had, I've had like a hundred followers at the start and it's like so painful. Like you know, like you're like bother them, nobody's listening to me, all that sort of stuff. But like work your ass off and then now like we'll get a couple of thousand followers a week organically because it's just I don't know it gains a critical mass I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned uh, suffering with depression and the stigma that's attached to it. And um, do you think that the failure of business and things like that have affected your, your depression, your financial or just clinical depression? Uh, I think a, a mixture, like those different things. I don't think business helps it at all because. Uh, it accentuates it because you're you're you've got so much like you can't sleep you've got to pay your wages you've got to 
going for a few pints because they're so stressed. You've got to go. So like I think that brought it on. I think I always had it, even when I was on the, like I now can recognize the signs when I was on the boats and stuff that I had it. Yeah. But I think the business definitely uh, really brought it on a lot. Uh, and I think that's why it's, that's kind of why I talk about it because I'm sure people here are talk, like there's definitely people here who suffer from it. Yeah. And I mean, maybe, maybe never been able to tell their friends or whatever. It's not that big a deal. You just take a little tablet every day in your gram. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, do you have any shares? <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. So the question in case you can't hear it is if I go back and start again, what would I do differently? If I would go back, or if there's anybody young here or old or trying to get, like, learn computer code. Like, that is <laughs> the best thing you could do. Like, uh, we can't find them to pay enough. Like, we pay people 80, 90 grand, and, like, they're, like, rock star premiership footballers. They're impossible to find. I'm sure it's the same in, in Paddy Park. So if you've got any kids or, like, forget about second languages or anything, like, just go and learn computer code. And also, like, I... I Kind of saw that, but I, I could never concentrate enough to, to code. But I, I learned it online for one weekend, just basic HTML and simple code. Go and teach yourself some some of that stuff because I know you're probably like in video or uh, drama or something. And you think it has no relevance? It has relevance to everything in the world right now in software. So like I, I would learn how to code if I could change. Oh, okay, I know. I'm doing my kids <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, but, um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> not really, I think the, like, the way I do it is, uh, like, people always say they're too busy, but then they'll sit down and watch The X Factor or shitty Sunderland against Swansea on a Monday night, when it's, like, just give up all that sort of stuff, or, like, if you really want to be a success, like, don't, you know, like, just cut out all, all the stuff that, that you really don't need to be doing, um, and get up a bit earlier. Like that's like it's not exactly groundbreaking advice, but yeah, yeah just uh, don't watch X Factor. <laughs> 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 that's good advice anyway. <laughs> but I, actually, just coming back to that, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, just listening to somebody who's talking, it sounds like he doesn't have a lot of advice in terms of time management. But I think when you're passionate about something, that really helps as well. Helps get you out of bed in the morning. Uh, anyone? Yes? Yeah, Carmen, I'm um, just very interested. It's, it's fascinating the way that you know exactly who your customer is, and it's almost one type of customer. Whereas in a lot of businesses, there's different ages and different types, <coughs> so it's completely so from that point of view. Um, and I know very little about Paddy Power from any angle. Where did social media come in for you? Were you there? Be was Paddy Power there before, and were they just all the same? Actually? Where exactly did it change <coughs> after you? So I suppose it's important to point out that for our social stuff, we have a very different type of customer after, and that's a soccer sponsor generally, and okay. horse racing also. There is also, like, we have gaming channels, we have bingo, which leads to predominantly female, and we have a, a social presence for them, but for, for the purpose of this is the scale, and, and, and the kind of what people know they power us, it, that's the type of customer I'm talking about, and I suppose it's understanding that type of customer, and getting that type of customer is, is the important part. And um, to answer your question, um, so social media, as, as I kind of tried to pronounce it, Paddy Power went in, in a very good place to be able to kind of uh, take advantage of social media in that. Um, like the sports book, for example, like footballers are, are idiots basically, <laughs> and people love soccer, and there's always really good content there for across the board for sport, and people are passionate about it. So it tied really well in that we could take advantage of that, and, and you know, uh, gambling kind of, whatever your opinions on it, is kind of branded as, as enhanced entertainment. It's something that people do on top of, of sporting and watching sport and being passionate about it. And having that fun on top as well. So we were in a great position to have a brand firstly that was um, you know, down to its roots, it, it's kind of Irish, it's mischievous, it's irreverent and kind of the word it, it's just having the crack and pulling the bits of people that were there doing that before that before social media <coughs> and just transferred really well onto it. That's not to say for anyone in the room who's not in the sporting industry or not um, you know gambling it, it couldn't work. There's a certain there's a tone of voice and understanding who your funders are and there's always really good content. One of the 
best online content people are um, called the AOs of uh, College UK who are appointed online. They get unbelievable engagement on washing machines. So they understand what they're doing, you know, and how they do it. And you see that engagement are, are huge as well. So it's not it's not unique to Paddy Power or, or King Alan. It's just being able to kind of have the right and understand what you're doing on it. Okay, and the other question just
for example, last year, when we were investing billions in a certain admin that does not exist anymore on Facebook, we can't actually do that. So if, if you were learning our strategy here, why we had a different conversation with you. So it kind of like, it, it, it's, it's just people, it's kind of a legacy thing, like you're saying about, you know, industries expect you have to have X amount of experience, this and that. What I would say is that things like, <coughs> PPC is a really good foundation for digital marketing because if you just kind of look at the very, very basics of what you're trying to do and how to segment them, Google have their package like down, they have blogs everywhere. It's, it's an absolute money churn, they're just shoveling it in the door and everyone uses it. So it's a really good foundation to have and to bring that sort of foundation to something like social where social can sometimes attract people who, who, who from my point of view, for paid social, digital marketing one, it can sometimes attract people who might, might be less um, inclined to look at the actual bottom line numbers. You know, um, there's a definitely there's a huge part that should be created in social. If you want to get into that area where you're looking at actual numbers and the bottom line, the ROI, and you know where to spend your money, a PPC is a very good foundation. So say something like the AdWords exam, learning that, taking over an account. If you have a friend who has you know a small restaurant or a business or whatever it might be, taking over that account, trying to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna optimize this account, I'm gonna do texting, and um, I'm gonna look at all the blogs, I'm gonna find the best way to do it. Because what I found is that kind of um, foundation has really led, and, and, and everything is so database in, in, in the industry. That's the <coughs> coding is massive, but also, Data is, is, is massive. Everything is tracked. There's just so much out there, and it's just growing exponentially. So if you have kind of a foundation, you can, you can build that up and understand how to how to split test things and how to understand how to you know come up with different concepts to, to drive optimization. That's probably the good thing I'd say. So would you hire someone that doesn't have the PE experience, but you know has been working on his own? Yeah, hire someone two months ago, which you could never really worked in social media before. To me, it's not really the type of person. And are they willing? Are they going to learn fast? Because honestly, it's, it's about you know, it's very different failing you know, when you start a business and learning with massive companies like that. But uh, you know, it is all about failing. And you know, Facebook is not going to do great things and fail fast or something. So it, it is that sort of it's recognised. And anyone who kind of is understands social media and digital marketing will recognise that you know, it's, what you did three years ago is pretty much redundant at this stage. It, it's, it's changed too much. Social media has completely shifted. But like I mentioned, with direct response. And you have to kind of be able to recognize that and move it. Has online marketing go away? But no, actually, it might get you to that way down that as well, but hiring people for digital. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly what I would say. There's, there's nothing you can really learn in college. Like it's 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 already outdated by you know like what is what would have been taught over in the day in like July is probably is probably outdated. If you could bring me like somebody who knows Google inside out, knows Google Analytics inside out, Facebook targeting, Twitter targeting, and, and knows those four platforms inside out, uh, and not even looking for, I think there's two very different types, um, as Cormac was saying, there's the analytical type of looking at the data and the numbers, and then there's the creative side. So you get a lot of people coming in from the creative side, which you need as well, and they'd have more of a PR background, or that sort of, sort of or maybe copywriting, or, or uh, design background, so there's, there's two very clear sides of it, but if, if you could come and say that you know everything about Google Analytics, everything about Facebook, Twitter, and and uh, measurements, then I think you have, and, and your competence, I think you could, you, that's the best way to get hired right now. Right, and just, to, again, just to get both of you to elaborate, <coughs> because I know there's a lot of people, you know, looking to get into the industry and first room the ladder and that kind of thing, you know, I mean, Say somebody has all of those skills and they have the right attitudes and stuff and so on, but how do they get on the <coughs> radar of I'm not saying yourselves, but guys like yourselves? Like how do you find your talents? Where do you get it from? So one of the best things I ever saw was like I logged into Facebook uh, one day and there was a picture of myself, like a banner of myself in the ads, and the guy had like scraped my personal ID and was just running an ad came an ad campaign for me and Lauren actually in Simply Nessie. So like we were the only people seeing those ads and then it took us off to micro sites and uh, he showed some examples of his work, so we hired him. Uh, it turned out he was absolutely useless. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good example. Like, there's, there's little clever hacks like that that you can do. Yeah. We, we the same thing, we shared some of the same thing. Which is, so it's a custom audience we mentioned, so they got the email address, we're going to match them up, and uh, well, I'm not saying everyone's going to do that, but uh, <laughs> for, for us, uh, like, we still have a traditional HR department that would do it. Um, LinkedIn's obviously massive. Um, okay. like, what about Josh's party? Josh, yeah, Phelan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is he still there? Yeah, he is, yeah, yeah. Okay. Phelan worked in the brand team. He was, he's involved in a lot of the stunts that you, you know, most people will see. Um, 
and he arrived there through a stunt. Yeah, I guess some of those, uh, he had a billboard and gone mm -hmm. in the road at Falls Bridge. That was just his last money, apparently, before he was leaving for Australia with a kind of sad face and a, a, a suitcase heading off <laughs> to, to the, the Sydney Opera House. Basically, that was Paddy. And I love the press coverage. And uh, yeah, so Paddy Power went to Bidden Ward to get the guy and got him. And he, yeah, he's still, he's still a stalwart. He's part of the brand team. It's worked out very well. Excellent. So, your re re rewarding creativity kind of off the bat stand out. Yeah, for that, the role game is perfect. Yeah. Like it's uh, personal, like that's grand, but you don't want to jeopardize your company. Or, or if you're a small startup, you need to be a little bit more careful. But uh, yeah, uh, no, I'd like it doesn't apply to us as much as us. Because the only thing is, I've worked with all the big brands in Ireland, and it, it hamstrings them an awful lot more than Paddy Power. Like they're just like, by the time that legal things come on, like it, it, there have been ten more campaigns that have come along. You know, sure. One of the best ones I've spoken about was Spencer's. Uh, on the last one coming out of that one, 2012 European Championship. <coughs> Paddy Power had given him a pair of jocks to wear with the Paddy Power logo. And uh, he scored a goal, didn't do it the first time. Then he got braver, he scored a second goal, and then he pulled him up to reveal the Paddy Power logo. So it's kind of a form of ambush. Um, and then we got fined, like, uh, he got fined 80,000 and he wasn't Paddy Power ever covered it. But on the back of it, um, the same time there was some sort of a, a racial row going on, um, and the person got fined less than Benton got fined. So it just took off again. You know, and, and it just was huge on publicity for Piper. How can Piper only get point is, or get on eight thousand when I think it's probably John Terry, I'm guessing. I don't know. Don't drag his name more and more. I was like, that's kind of an example where it took off again with that legal. I kind of know what you're saying is that like it's a bit offset because it's worse. You know, bound to things on publicity versus the legal. Only can actually court. Okay, take a couple more questions. I think it's like LinkedIn is very simple. It's it's a job site and it's a source for leads that you can that you can buy. I don't think it's anything more than that. People try to have fancy content strategies and all that. So like it's it's just a big fancy job site. I, it's my take on it. I wouldn't waste any time on it personally, but it might be effective for you. Yeah, right back. Yes. <coughs> uh, I have this question for you, Nine. Um, it's about the London Dublin uh, project. Just about the revenue stream that you see working, or the revenue model you see working for something like Love and Love, because it doesn't seem to be overly advertised at the moment. And just a kind of follow on similar type question is the, uh, about how your recently launched uh, pay per month app is performed, and you see that as a, as a potential part. Yeah, so, so we're lucky with Love and Love in that like, we've, we've grown a really big audience and we're and um, we're kind of throwing five or six different things out there to see what what makes money and and the reason for that is i'm sure Cormac would agree is banner ads are a really crap form of advertising online like the the the, the click-through rates just can't get any lower like they, they're, they're grand for the really big guys to brand themselves up a little bit and stuff like that but it, i don't think there's a huge global scalable business there from us doing banner ads and um, so what we're what we're working on is like we're doing a, a huge event this year that is year one and like two thousand people there it's on monday um, and then year two will have ten thousand people so like we'll develop a huge event around that 
um, a paid app, trying that, 3,000 people downloaded, 150 are paying, uh, so we're, we're, that's okay, but it's not gonna pay the bills either. And then uh, some really clever sponsored content. So really what we're doing at the moment is growing the audience really, really big, um, and then hopefully we're gonna be able to make the money from it from one of those revenue streams, but it's really just a case of throwing a few against the wall and seeing which one sticks. Yeah, lunchboxes. Yeah, look, lunchboxes as well, which are, uh, very, like we're trying to bridge the gap between online and offline in terms of like, the, like if you go on to the Indo or the Irish Times or any of their websites, like they've got banner, like they can't fit more ads onto a piece of content and like there's only so far you can squeeze that one piece of content whereas we think we might be able to do clever uh, things around. That's uh, just to elaborate on that one other point is like everybody when they're looking in from the outside, say with Paddy Power in the early days, ourselves and said, like everybody thinks you're a genius just because you've sold a company or because you're paddy power. Like there's a lot of it. Like I was in the office today and we're making like we're still flying by by the seat of our pants making it up as we go along. Like people will sit there and tell you that they it was all a big genius plan that we like absolutely not. Like, the same as you guys. Like you, some things work, some things don't, but you just you keep trying it until you, you get the one that does work and then you nail in on that. We have another question back. Rose? Actually, no, just on that, when you're talking about the whole flying with these pants, thank you, honestly. Um, any general advice on choosing a uh, business model for, um, for a startup? Uh, I guess it depends what type of startup, but uh, make money. Uh, I, know that, I know that, but I didn't know that in my first business. <laughs> uh, we thought we were doing great because we had like, so, so much web traffic and coverage and stuff, but like, Genuinely, I get pitched by loads of people for investment in, in their startups, and money's kind of like the last thing. It's like they, they'll tell me about their brand, and they'll tell me about their great social campaigns, and their, uh, you know, the, the things they're going to do in the future. But like, there's no focus on, on making money. Like, no matter, uh, like Facebook or Google's a really good example. You, you work in Google, like Google know exactly what they do. Like they sell advertising and they sell it in the most targeted possible way and they give their customers the exact ROI of, of how they're gonna make more money and, and that's why the money gets shoveled through the door from their customers. So like, just figure out how you're gonna make money and, and the <coughs> razor are sharp on it, I would say. And last question here, one, uh, just a um, He's talking about Facebook and Twitter, but would you put as much value in sites like Pinterest or Instagram? Me? Or either. Yeah, well, it's a really good question. Um, for me personally, we can only advertise on Facebook and Twitter, so that's why we have, that's why everything I mentioned here is, is on that. Pinterest is coming down the line, and uh, Instagram is coming down the line, but it's very different. Um, but our, our content team would definitely be, be using those platforms, and um, Pinterest not so much because that would actually be more of a bigger demographic. Um, it, it's much more heavily skewed towards emails and kind of recipes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, things like Instagram. Uh, Instagram's a fast growing social network, as far as I'm aware, um, and it's a very different type of, like, you know, I spoke here about, about imagery being massive, you know, and our guys kind of recently, we had this conversation about how do we kind of adopt towards Instagram, what do we do on it, um, and they've kind of taken it on themselves, so they, they've looked at what the, what people are expecting, what kind of working well on it, and kind of put a twist on it again, as I say, it's a brand twist, so they have, like, they have a really scenic picture with really obscene rapper quotes on the process, so instead of a, you know, have a great day, I think it's just, you know, some lyrics from, uh, I don't know who, some Snoop Dogg or something going across it. And it's just kind of a twist on it, a brand twist on it. Likewise with Snapchat, um, <coughs> we've, we've also gotten a Snapchat presence now, we're driving to an offer every so often too. And it's a very different demographic, much younger, and um, people kind of often, often tell stories that Facebook's, you know, it's declining, it's going to be gone, yeah. it's not. But like, what will happen is that different parts will shift other businesses most likely. Um, and Snapchat, along that line is a very different demographic that we can then target and engage on that network. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, we would have presences there. And I think for me, from my point of view, if we've invested so heavily <coughs> in, in, and I'm going to echo this, you can kind of cross sell them to different platforms as well. So you know, you can put up on Facebook, you know, send someone's Instagram to follow you there as well, so that they'll, they'll, they'll try to extra content going into their feed and then try to adopt your content to that different, um, you know, if, if it's something like Instagram's way more visual, doing that and Snapchat picture with some sort of like, you know, the demographic of 18, 22 year olds, whatever it might be, that's the way we work it. The only thing I'd kind of add to that is that uh, there's always a Wild West sort of 
phase on a social network where the social network are not making money themselves and, and Twitter are kind of still a bit of just past that, but it's always like we're so heavily invested in our time in Instagram at the moment because they don't have ads yet. When they don't have ads, you can come along and there's all sorts of hacks like you probably remember in Facebook you used to be able to like and share competitions and click here to like this, like loads of tricks to get likes. Like that's totally front up on now. So before the advertising and the paid guys come along and they lock down the rules and there's there's no way to sort of kind of break those rules. There's, there's a, a wild west phase where you can maybe build up an audience. But at the same time, 65% um, of our traffic comes from Facebook uh, on, on Love in Dublin. And it's the big, uh, people like I've been hearing that same question for five years, like, where, where, like what's the next one? What's coming next? Like it's still Facebook. There's no doubt that it's still Facebook by, by a country mile. All right, uh, I'm going to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen, Cormac Tall.